Okay, I believe we are live for another exciting interview. And today, I really am very excited and honored to introduce to you all Dan Blanchard, a best selling, award winning author, speaker, educator, and TV host. Dan, a very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks, James. I'm so happy to be here on your show and I look forward to spending some time talking with your audience. Wonderful. Now, Dan, please, can you just tell us a little bit in your own words to best describe uh, post-COVID what, what you were up to and what a typical day looked like for Dan? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's funny. I was just on a youth seminar. I was just talking about the same thing. And I always said that uh, it's like seasons of your life. You know what I'm saying? This COVID-19 coronavirus is just seasons of your life. Uh, some people may know this, but I'm also a history teacher. Is one of the things I do as an educator. So I taught about like the 1918 pandemic, the 1957 one in the United States. You know, there's been four other before this. So in historical speaking, it's seasons of your life. But when it comes to your personal uh, well-being, your personal development, it's also just another season of your life. It's going to come. It's going to go. Now, for some people, they're just going to just sit back and not do much. You know what I'm saying? They're going to sit there and watch TV, maybe eat too much. Some people might drink too much. You're going to put on some, a few pounds, maybe more pounds than you want to. And the three months is going to go by or six months is going to go by or whatever it is. It's going to come by and you're going to come out the back end. And for some people, they're not going to really be in a better position than when they went in. Now, for other people, it's a different ballgame. I mean, this season of their life is going to allow them to do certain things that they've always wanted to do, that, but haven't had time to do. Yeah. You know, this is a great time to enrich your life and do things that you haven't been able to do. So for an example, let's say you want to learn a musical instrument, but you're just saying, I'm just too busy. I'll never have time to do that until I retire. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. I think you might have a little time right now <laughs> to learn that musical instrument. How about all those people out there are saying, I want to write a book, but again, never can do that until like, maybe I retired. That'd be the first time in my life I may have time. Well, guess what? Maybe that book writing season's here right now. Mm -hmm. You know, for the next three months, six months, Think of the great start you could get on writing a book, maybe even complete it. So, you know, if you want to learn to draw, if you want to learn to paint, if you've been meaning to paint the bathroom and just haven't gotten to it, or your bedroom, if you want to wake up every single day and look at a cooler bedroom, you can. You've got the time right now to enrich your life. I mean, I'm out in the yard doing yard work every day. I, I'm even creating and building a medieval fort in my uh, yard. Uh, yeah, I, I get a lot of rocks. So I'm digging up these rocks and building these rock walls and making my yard so I can mow it. And beautiful green grass can grow now in areas that couldn't grow. And me and my kids have a medieval fort that I'm working on that someday we're going to play in it. And someday when this season's over and we come out the back end, I'm going to be driving my car down my driveway saying, yeah, this is a pretty cool place. You know, so I'm going to enjoy looking at it. So there's just a million and one things you can do to come out on the back end. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, maybe you are missing, maybe you're a high school kid and you're missing your sports season. All right? Well, maybe there's some technique you want to work on that you haven't gotten to. You know, maybe there's a different kind of fitness, athletic training you wanted to do but haven't gotten to. You know, maybe you don't have good flexibility. So maybe this is a good time to squeeze in some yoga, you know, into your life. You know, how about this? Maybe this is a good time to start squeezing in, cooking home meals and working on better nutrition so that you come out the back end of this in a better place than when you went in on it. Maybe it's a time to get your finances straightened out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? This is good that me and my family are not eating out a couple of times a week. You know, the nutrition's good. And the money we're saving, I'm not eating out a couple of times a week. You know what I'm saying? So for me, like in a nutshell, this has been a blessing. I know some people are like depressed, sad, gaining weight, thinking that this is lost time. This is not lost time. I mean, I'm up every single morning super early 
writing books. I've got a bunch of books that are like partially done that I'm finishing up. So, and then after that, I'm teaching virtual school for a few hours uh, up to about noon. And then from there, I'm working in the yard, getting my sunshine, fresh air, exercise. And in fact, when I look out my window, I see something better than it was before. You know I'm saying? I've taken out a couple online university classes that I am, I'm a professor uh, at. So, and then at night, guess what? Me and my wife are finally catching up on some of our Netflix series. And we're, you know, we're spending time together, just hanging out. I mean, this is just a season of your life. And if you use your time wisely, if you're smart about it, this is a really good season of your life. I mean, you could still do what you got to do. I mean, I'm still teaching school, high school. But look at all the other things I'm doing now. Yes. So why not? Why wouldn't you make a good use of your time with this? Oh, Dan, it's very, very well said. And, and in particular, I'm drawn to what is clearly a tremendous work ethic. Can you expound on where that came from? Uh, was it your family? Can you tell me where this great drive, determination and work ethic came from, Dan? You know, that's a great question, uh, James. Um, I think back to like when I was a kid, I was always like the runt. You know, the litter, the smallest kid. I grew up on the wrong side of the train tracks. So I wasn't like hitting any home runs academically in school either. You know, rough upbringing. So for me, I mean, I didn't really have much I could do, except, you know, I played sports. Yeah. And when you played sports, I mean, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the world to play sports. You don't even have to know to read well to play sports. Yeah. So I played sports. I started making a little progress because I just, I just noticed that I was outworking everybody. And when I was outworking everybody, again, I didn't have to be the best reader in the team. I didn't have to be the fastest, the biggest, the strongest, the most experienced, nothing. But if I outworked people, I started getting better in the sports I was playing. And then I was playing football, basketball, baseball. Eventually, I went over to wrestling, and I became a two-time junior Olympian wrestler. You know, just, I think, based on just effort. I mean, I remember one time, one of my junior Olympic teammates, I was out with him and another junior Olympic teammate, and one of them was truly gifted. He's been wrestling since he was like three years old. His dad brought him all over the country, the world wrestling. Everybody knew that he was going to be awesome. Right? The other guy, crazy, crazy strength, right? Just really, really just tough and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I'm sitting there having lunch with these guys, and, and the bigger guy. He says to me, he says, you know, Dan, he goes, I watched you wrestle. And he goes, I swear you were just out there willing it to happen. You know, just willing it like you would not quit your effort, you know, that you were just going and going and going. And you just willed your way into being an elite wrestler. You know what I'm saying? And the really cool thing about this was 10 years later, I was actually twice the junior Olympic wrestling coach. And, and a lot of people say that great wrestling coaches, uh, let me back up, great wrestlers don't always make the great wrestling coaches yes. because they don't understand why the kids just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? But for me, I got it. I understood it. And it really helped me make, you know, be a great coach was that I understood that not every kid was super talented, super fast, super tall, super strong or super gifted you know, are, are just lucky. Not every kid had a father that was dragging them around the country, giving them all sorts of sports opportunities and coaching, best coaches in the world. You know what I'm saying? So I, I understood that, you know, you, you, most kids didn't have this. And most kids, it was a learning process and a slow learning process where the coach needed to have some um, patience, you know, and bring them along. And with effort, you could overcome your shortcomings. I got that, you know, and it made me a much, much better coach. So I think I've always had that work ethic, you know, and I still have it. I, you know, it started off with sports, you know, then it went into schooling and I ended up getting, you know, complete. And once the, the education bug bit, I ended up completing 14 years of college and getting seven degrees. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then it went into my profession, you know, becoming a teacher, a coach, and then later an author. You know, I've written maybe almost 20 books now, about a half a dozen of them are uh, bestsellers. Well done. And it went into me being a father, you know, always giving that extra effort to the husband, you know, saying there's a lot of work in being a good husband, you know, a good father. 
know what I'm saying? So you, you got to put the work in to do that stuff. So for me, it's always been there. And it's always kind of knocked on whatever door was next. Mm. You know, the next season of my life, the next stage of my life. And say, here I am. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to be a father now. I'm going to do it. Let's do it right. Let's get 110% in doing that. So now what season are we in now? COVID-19. Right? So what are we going to do? Let's do it right. Let's give 110% to come out on the other end of this in a better place than when we went, we went in it. I mean, we could do this. Every one of us could do this. So I say just work hard. Work hard, and when you start having success, hopefully that success, you know, encourages you to keep working hard because if you do, you'll have more success. Oh, no. And that's pretty much the formula. Work yeah. hard, have a little success. Work hard again, have a little bit more success. Yeah. Oh, I love it, Dan. And what really strikes me when you say that is the power of your perspective in managing all of these various transitions. And as you say, we're going through another transition. So we could look at it as being negative. I love the power of your positive thinking. Can you talk a little bit, Dan, on managing those transitions from maybe being an engaged man to a married man, from experiencing trauma and stress to coming out with on the other side victory and triumph can you speak a little bit about how you've managed that Dan you know it's funny James it's sort of like my grandmother my grandmother uh she went to Yale uh during a time where women like didn't really go to college Amazing. and, and yes she was in the music department because to eventually become a music teacher you know what I'm saying? Because that was kind of what was acceptable for women back then. Yes. Was that you became a teacher if you were a woman. But once you got married and got pregnant, that kind of went away, you know, and you went home, became a mom, right? Um, but my grandmother used to always say, oh, by the way, she graduated from Yale at 18 years old. Amazing. So uh, picture that, right? Yeah. But uh, my grandmother used to always say to me, she used to say, this too shall pass. You know what I'm saying? So when you think about it, Nothing we're doing is life or death, you know, pretty much it may feel that way. Sometimes it may stress us out when we're going from one thing to another, we have to transition into something else, you know, change. Nobody likes change. Change is difficult. You know, the fear of the unknown that bothers all of us, yeah. the fear of the unknown, you know, but like Henry James, the founder of a modern psychology said 90% of the worst things that have ever happened to me, only happened in my mind, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It never really happened. <laughs> all these terrible things I, I feared, you know, all, all these terrible things I worried about the unknown never really happened. And I just think this whole worry is worrying and this fair thing of transitioning into a new stage in your life is a terrible use of our imagination. You know what I'm saying? Our imagination is a creative genius inside of us and it should be used. Our imagination should be used as the creative genius, it was meant to be by our creator. You know, not as some fair monger, you know, some worry wart, you know what I'm saying? But that's what we do. So like my grandmother said, James, this too shall pass. It's not gonna be as bad as we think. No. You know what I'm saying? It's not life or death. So let's go in here. Yeah, there's gonna be some things that we're not gonna know. There's gonna be some unknown fear, but instead of being scared, how about be exhilarated about the next stage or the next transition? No. of your life yes. you know what i'm saying get in there because guess what this now is like a new learning opportunity mm -hmm. this is now a time to sharpen your intelligence meet new people build new skills build more intelligence you know and maybe if you're getting older in life you know delay the whole um alzheimer's sort of thing that starts taking over our minds when we're not learning anything new yes. you know what i'm saying uh, i met jim peckham many many years ago he's an olympic wrestling coach mm. and i believe it was the 76 i think olympic team that he was the u.s olympic coach and i met him and when i met him james he was showing this move and some high school kids said hey coach coach can we do this move a different way that was at the clinic yeah. and everybody was like oh my gosh what is that kid thinking you don't tell the olympic coach how to do a move you know mm. what i'm saying and the olympic coach jim Beckham, who's you know he's gone now but he looked at this young, like, 14-year-old boy, and he sat there, and he kind of 
scratched his chin a little bit. He put the hair out of his face. And he went, yeah, I think you could do it that way too. I hadn't really thought about that, Imagine. but I think you can. And then Jim Peckham says, hey, when you stop learning in this sport, it's time to hang up your shoes. And I have never forgotten about that. Very and powerful. to Very this powerful. day, I'm not hanging up my wrestling shoes or any shoes that I have. Wow. Oh, that is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Dan. That really, gosh, that really touches me. That reminds me of something my, my beautiful grandma used to say, what was, which was always be a lifelong learner. And yes, maybe when I was young, I didn't fully understand that. But as I've grown and had the privilege to continue learning myself, I now see the value in that. And Dan, as an educator yourself, can you speak a bit about the importance of being a lifelong learner and indeed passing on whatever knowledge and wisdom we may have gained to the next generation, as I know you do with your work mm. with the teens and so on? I'm so glad you brought that up, James, because for the last like two plus decades, I've been writing books and speaking and, and teaching and doing all that. And one of the common themes that I have um, emphasized over and over and over again is to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. You know, when my students or even when my colleagues are like impressed by where I am today, I'm saying even my old teachers, you know, I bump into my old teachers, you know, once in a while and they shake their head and they smile and they laugh and they go, damn, well, I said, I would have never imagined, right? And I'm like, yeah, you'd be surprised if you're being a lifelong learner. You know, I was a straight C student in high school. Mm -hmm. You know, I got just enough grades to play sports. And that was about it, right? But if you're a lifelong learner, you can make incredible things happen, right? So when my old teachers or my colleagues or my students, you know what I'm saying, or my family members, when they're impressed, with where my lifelong learning has gotten me so far, I'm always thinking, thank you, that's awesome. You know, I appreciate that. But we'll wait for another five years yeah. or 10 more years and see where I'm at then. I go, how about 20 or 30 or 40 more years? I can't even imagine, it's mind blowing where I'm gonna be then, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm a lifelong learner. So the other side of that coin is you become a better, Lifelong learner, James, when you start sharing what you know. You know, I always say, teach to learn, give to get. And I'm saying, I always say that. Oh, that's great. Can you, first can, can you just repeat that, Dan? I, I, I really like years that. Old. Sorry, can you just repeat that? I want to make yes, a note of that. I've always said, yes, I've always said, you got to teach to learn and you got to give to get. And when I first learned that, in a way that really stuck with me. I was a 20 year old young man and I got hired to be a high school wrestling coach, right? Again, I, you know, I'm a two time state champ, two time junior Olympian wrestler and all that. And, and, and I got in there and I got all this mus muscle memory about how to do this and how to do that. And I gotta tell you in the beginning, it was a little weird because I was like, well, why don't the kids just do what I tell them to do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So what I had to learn before that season was over, I had to learn to break every little teeny, eeny, winny thing down into a way that I could explain to the kids what I was doing in a way that they could get it, understand it, and apply it instead of me just reacting with muscle memory. You know what I'm saying? And when I found myself going through these tiny steps that make up my fluid movements, I started understanding the sport of wrestling way back. Wrestling was all about, because I was a two-time junior Olympian and on my way to be soon a two-time junior Olympian coach. Mm. So I thought I knew what it was all about, but when I began coaching and teaching the sport of wrestling, that's when I really started to get a real understanding of the sport of wrestling. Right. And then I became a school teacher, you know, and I started teaching history. And I thought I knew a little bit about history, but well, I know a hundred times more about history now that I'm a history teacher. Right. And not only was I a history teacher, but I'm also 
uh, simultaneously a special education teacher at the same time. So I do both. I work in a special school yeah. where I do both. You know what I'm saying? So I thought I knew like some education pedagogies and you know the science and art of uh, teaching, but doing it, teaching kids with special needs, you know what I'm saying? Uh, kids that learn differently, which we all, no, none of us just fit in a box, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I learned so much about teaching, you know what I'm saying? I, so I taught to learn, started off with wrestling first, then it got in the classroom, you know? And then what I was learning was I was always giving up myself, giving up myself, giving up myself, right? And, but, and then it started kind of coming back. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving them myself, giving them myself. The next thing I know, James, people like you are contacting me saying, hey, I'd love to have you on my show. Mm. Hey, love to have you write a column. Love to have you write an article. Love to have you write a blog. Hey, come on my TV show. Hey, come on my radio show. Hey, can I buy some of your books? Hey, can I do this? Hey, can I share a stage with you? Can you come on my stage? Hey, can you? And just, I get people all the time reaching out to me to share great moments with me that they created. You know what I'm saying? I didn't create this grave. I didn't create this show here today. You did. James, you created this great moment for me and you to share together to like improve the quality of my life, the joy in my life, you know? And through it, it boomerangs right back over where now I'm giving to your audience. Yes. You know, some of my insights. So I've always, it's just something that's just so reinforced. You know what I'm saying? You give to get. Yes. You teach to learn. Wonderful. You know what I'm saying? These are the things you do that are going to improve the little circles around you and like throwing a, po a pebble into a pond. Those little circles kind of get a little bit wider, right? Yeah. So as long as you keep teaching people, sharing what you know, giving 100% of yourself, 110% of yourself, and you're kind, you have to be kind. You've got to be friendly. But if you're doing these things, you already are most likely. Yes. You know, a kind, friendly, good-hearted person, right? You're teaching, you're giving, and those little, that little circle is getting better. You're making the world better, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, those circles, right? Like, yes. the, pot, like the pebble in the pot, right? Mm -hmm. And you're making bigger and bigger and bigger circles better, right? And then in the same point, those circles are making you better. You know what I'm saying? Because they just are. It's just that kind of unwritten, universal law. Oh, yeah, oh, Dan, that's beautifully, beautifully put, and, and thank you for sharing. And, and on this point, I'd love to hear your opinion on so many people have previously said to me that they're waiting for an opera. Key word here being waiting, Dan. They're waiting for someone to give them the stage, waiting for someone to bestow greatness upon them, waiting for an opportunity to serve. What I notice about men like you is that you didn't wait to serve. You served where you were planted. Can you speak about the power of that, please, Dan? A absolutely. That's, I'm so glad you brought that question up, James. I just wrote a chapter of a new book. <clears throat> about how most of those authors that I'm surrounded by are retired. Wow. You know, and I'm the Connecticut president of the Association of Publishers for Special Sales. It's an independent authors and independent publishers association. I'm the president. Wow. And I'm like 20 years younger than like everybody else there. Wonderful. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's like retired who I associate with, you know, in those circles. Because the thing is, they, they, they wait. They wait till they're retired because then they think that's when they'll have time to write their book. And the chapter I just wrote, wrote, it said, no, no, no. Don't wait till you're older and wiser to write a book. You know, you may think that makes sense, but you know what makes better sense? Do it when you're young. So now your parents start seeing you as some sort of expert. Mm -hmm. Your day job starts respecting you more and starts giving you more opportunities to sit on expert panelists. You know, leadership teams gives you pay raises, job promotions. You know, because you didn't wait and you created that expert status in, in, early in your life, yeah. right? So why would you? And then the journey, the journey for the next 30 years is going to be way better mm -hmm. if you don't wait to the end to do this sort of thing. You do it in the beginning, the journey gets way better. The other thing I say is, guess what? The Easter Bunny's not coming to save you. Neither is Santa Claus, neither is the Tooth Fairy, mm -hmm. Right? None of that is coming. Santa Claus is not coming to save you. This is a do-it-yourself project. 
your life is a do-it-yourself project. You cannot sit back and wait for the Easter Bunny to come and give you the life that you want. It, it ain't happening. Nobody's showing up on your doorstep. Nobody's coming to save you. And I know that may sound like a little cruel to some people, but it's actually a gift. Because if you keep waiting for someone to come and save you, if you keep waiting for the Easter Bunny to come and give you something, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Next thing you know, you're going to be retired saying, I should have done this. I should have done that. Next thing you know, you're going to be in your 80s rocking on your front porch in that rocking chair, you know, counting up all the regrets you have in life. You know what I'm saying? I got to tell you, people don't go through when they're rocking in that chair at the end of their life. They don't sit there and think about all the dumb things they did. Mm -hmm. They most often think about the things they missed out on. Thank the regrets you. they have, the yeah. things they should have done and could have done. But for some reason, they just couldn't seem to kick themselves in the butt enough to do it. You know what I'm saying? Or nobody else kicked them in the butt and held them to the fire to make them do it. Or, you know, or why didn't Santa Claus ever show up and make them do it, mm -hmm. right? That's what's going to happen to rock and share regrets mm -hmm. at the end of their life. No one's coming to save you. You got to do it yourself. Life is a do-it-yourself project. And if you do it in the beginning of your life, early in your life instead of the end of your life, the ride, the journey through the life. We all know that life is not a destination, it's a journey, right? Yeah. The journey through life is gonna be so much better when you do it the way I'm preaching. So do it now, don't wait. Oh, it's great advice, Dan. And, and actually, there's a nice flow to this. I'd like to lead into something that's just, I've thought about. Those that may be listening that are struggling with motivation and those that haven't are unable to, to work with someone like yourself to be held accountable, can you share any tips, tools, or strategies that might begin lighting that fire for their motivation intrinsically or otherwise? Absolutely. Um, Goya, G-O-Y-A. Some people may say, see it as a Spanish international type of food or seasoning or whatever they see it. I don't. I see Goya, G-O-Y-A, as get off your arse. <laughs> <laughs> get off your arse. Once you get off your arse and you start moving, you're doing something. You know, Roosevelt during the Great Depression might have been one of the greatest presidents ever in the United States. He always said, above all, do something, right? So this is what I've learned about doing something. Motion creates emotion. So let me say that again. Motion creates emotion. When you put your body in motion, doing the smallest thing, maybe the most insignificant thing in your mind, you're gonna to start to get your emotions rolling a little bit. And once your emotions start rolling a little bit, those emotions are gonna supply you with energy to keep doing more, which will lead to eventually effort, yeah. right? So now your emotion creates emotion, right? Which creates energy, which creates effort. Mm -hmm. And after sustained effort, you cannot help but have some success. And a little success will lead to more motivation for you to repeat the cycle, all right? So it all starts with in the beginning. Goya, get off your arse. Once you start moving your body, once you have motion, you create emotion, right? Yes. Which goes right down the line to where you want to go with motivation. Now, if you don't think, if some people out there, James, some of your audience is not sure what I'm talking about. You know, I, right now, all of them, I mean, any one of them, right now, jump up, put your head up, look to the sky, put a huge smile on your face, jump up a little bit like an athlete does before a competition, and then sit back down real quick. And I bet you right now you're feeling 100% better. I bet you right now you're feeling motivated yeah. at least a little bit. Yeah. Your body's operating differently yeah. right now. And that was, what, maybe two seconds of motion? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it's very powerful, Dan. And thank you for sharing, sharing that, the power of being able to change states. And as you say, it's a lot quicker than a lot of people, I think, imagine. Now, I would love to hear your opinion on what I, I call the power of purpose. It's so clear to me that you are a man that is led by purpose. And I know in part that having a strong purpose can get a lot done. Dan, can you speak about maybe where you found purpose or maybe an early inspiration or mentor that helped you focus your purpose, please? Absolutely. I mean, many, many years ago, I read Rick Warren's book, The Purposeful, I forget, Life, Purpose Living or something like that. Um, it was a great book all about purpose. And at that time, I hadn't realized that I was actually living a life of purpose. I didn't know it yet. I was still, you know, a young man. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. See, see, here's the thing. You know, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. I had an uh, you know, abusive alcoholic father, dysfunctional family living in poverty. Sorry, Dan, My father you, was struggling with some. Can you remind us where that was, please? I haven't, uh, where, where you grew up. Please remind me. In, in the United States and Connecticut. Right, yeah. Which is, which is nestled right in between Boston and New York City. I see. It is Connecticut. Okay. So shows where he self-medicated uh, with alcohol. All right. Um, I was the type of boy that wasn't going to make it. You know what I'm saying? My brother didn't make it. My little brother didn't make it. Eventually my mom, she's no longer with us. She didn't make it. You know what I'm saying? I, I come from those circumstances. And, and at some point, you know, I land as a school teacher in the special education programs with troubled kids who have huge behavioral problems because many of them are growing up the same way I grew up. You know what I'm saying? Just trauma, you know, trauma infested lives. You know what I'm saying? So who's helping those kids? Who's getting those kids through it? Me, you know what I'm saying? I'm their example, I'm their inspiration. I'm the guy that's not gonna give up on them even when they tell me, you know, to go F myself every single day. You know, I'm the guy that's not going to quit on them. I'm the guy that loves them and sees the purpose of what I'm doing and what they're going to be doing someday when they pay it forward. We know when they become older and, and thank God that they had a guy like me or maybe a, a woman similar, you know, of, of qualities in their life. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And then they're paying it forward, you know, and they can connect with troubled kids that would dealt a bad hand of cards, you know, and unfortunately in this world, there's way too many kids out there that are being dealt a bad hand of cards. You know what I'm saying? And what are we going to do with them? You know what I'm saying? We're just going to wash them away? That ain't going to happen. We're going to throw them all in jail? That's not the solution. You know what I'm saying? So what are we going to do with them? We're going to let them run the streets and terrorize the neighborhoods? No. We have to somehow make better people of them. We have to somehow give them hope. Somehow stack the deck a little more favorably. You know what I'm saying? For these people to grow up to be decent citizens that can be decent fathers and mothers. You know what I'm saying? And right now, we're lacking that. We're lacking that. But my purpose is to change that one student at a time. Yes. You know, one athlete at a time. You know, I'm changing that. You know, and I'm inspiring others to jump on my wagon and try to do the same. You know what I'm saying? Go out there. Get a kid that's struggling. And realize that kid's struggling probably for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And do whatever you can do to be the one positive relationship in that kid's life because every kid only needs one positive relationship to have a chance of turning things around. Yes. And we can do it. So why not? Why not be that one positive relationship in that kid's life? You're making that kid's life better. Believe it or not, you're making your life better. And in some small ways, you're making the world a better place. And that's what we all should be trying to do making the world a better place. Ah, oh, absolutely, Dan. Very well said. We're coming to a close of the first part of this interview. We will pick this up, absolutely. And, but I wanted to just speak about some of your work and please could you provide, first of all, I'd like you to talk about your books and we will expound upon this in the next interview, but also where people can find them and some of your actual <coughs> links on social media so people can get to know you and your work, Dan. 
Oh, absolutely, James. So people can find me on danblanchard.net. And they can find me on granddaddysecrets.com. Saying they can find me on Amazon under Dan Blanchard. Um, a lot of my leadership books are there. And they can also find me under Daniel Blanchard right. on Amazon. A lot of my academic yes. uh, books are there. They can find me in all the social media channels, pretty much like, you know, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the uh, Twitter, the Instagram, the Pinterest. I'm on all of them. I have a YouTube channel under Dan Blanchard. Right. You know, ch definitely check me out there. They can find me on uh, Mindalia TV, uh, English. Uh, you can definitely find me there. Um, and if you go on any of these places, there's contact information where you can reach out to me and, uh, and I will return your email if you reach out to me. So please check me out on social media, on the web and uh, reach out to me. I'll get back to you. Wonderful, Dan. And is there one book, if you had to recommend a, the best place as an introduction to you and your work, is there one book you would push more than the others just to get the ball rolling? One of my favorite books is called The Storm, How to Make Young Men into Good Men. And it also has with it um, a student workbook and a teacher workbook for educational institutions that are traditional and non-traditional. You know, this is a great book about a struggling kid and about a granddaddy that comes back into his life to change the path, the trajectory of this kid's life. I'm saying, it's been, it's been um, read and endorsed by some of the most amazing people out there. Well, not so definitely check out the storm. You won't be sorry if Love you uh, read that book. I'm telling you. And is that a book you co-authored? Was that one of yours, Dan? No, the, I authored that one all by myself. But the workbooks that go with it. You know, I had people, that tutors from all over the world that were using the storm to tutor kids all over the world. Yeah. And one of the tutors reached out to me and she said, we need a workbook. And I'm like, yeah. And she knew my book inside and out. And she was teaching kids lessons through my book. So I said, why don't we co-author a student workbook? So me and Eagle Moon Rays, we co-authored a student workbook and we co-authored a teacher workbook to go with the storm. Brilliant. So now there's no excuse not to use it. You know, saying it's all right there, laid out for you, nice and simple. And it's one of the most intriguing, exciting, fascinating, um, filled wisdom, nuggets of wisdom. I mean, it literally would change your life yeah. if you read the book, The Storm, How Young Men Become Good Men by Dan Blanchard. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, thank you. That's a beautiful place. Just to close this first part of our interview, Dan, Dan, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for the work that you do and for the light that you spread. And um, I, I admire and respect your work ethic. And it's been a real honor and a pleasure speaking with you today. Likewise. And thank you, James, for giving me this opportunity to be with you and your audience. My pleasure. Thank you, Dan.